Welcome to the course on deep learning. We're going to talk about sequence models today. So in other words, LSTMs and applications. So this is part of our sequence models basics. And we'll start with just, you know, what it takes to actually model a sequence and some basic statistical tools. Later on, we'll cover LSTMs and then deeper RNNs and bidirectional models and why you may or may not need them. Um, so on to sequence models. So what we have here is a dependency graph, right? So it goes from left to right and every object there influences all of its descendants, but none of the ancestors. So I can write things out as P of X is P of X one times P of X two given X one times P of X three given X one and two all the way up to P of X T. And I can always find this expansion, right? That's just conditional probabilities. By the way, I could also peel it off from the end to the beginning, right? I could always also write it as P of X T times P of X T minus one given X T and all the way backwards. So usually you want to work forwards in time, right? Because this is how things work causally, unless you're an archeologist. In which case you maybe observe the endpoint or maybe the past two or three time points and then you want to work your way backwards into the past and figure out where things started. Or let's say you're an astronomer and you want to figure out how the universe started then you start with the measurements that we have today and you work your way backwards. But short of that, you always want to work forwards in time in a causal model. So in terms of an autoregressive setup, you could write this as P of X T given X one up to T minus one is just P of X T given some function F of X one to X T minus one. For instance, you could just estimate the mean or the variance for some regression setting. Well, it really depends on what you have. Now this is in general, a rather difficult problem because you're going to get a longer and longer history of past observation as we move forward. So one way to simplify this is by using what's called a Markovian assumption, namely that I really only care about a few past steps in the past. In other words, my P of X T given X one through X T minus one, is really best written as P of X T given X T minus tau up to X T minus one. So I only look tau steps into the past and no further than that. Now, for instance, let's say I have a traffic light. In that case, this is a pretty good assumption because you know the light goes from green, goes to yellow, goes to red, goes to green. So there's a very simple state transition. I'm ignoring here the fact that those phases have different durations, in which case you would get a semi-Markov model, but overall, this is a fairly sensible assumption. Now, the alternative though is to say, well, maybe I have some latent variable. So in that case, that latent variable ideally explains things in a slightly more flexible manner. So for instance, let's say I want to model the stock market, I could assume that the latent variable is whether that's a bull or a bear market. And then given that I can go and model the specific dynamics of stock. Or let's say I model that Alex is in the mood of, you know, buying a camera. And so now I'm going to model all of his, you know, web browsing behavior based on whether he wants to buy himself a new camera. Okay, so that would be the latent model H, uh, latent variable HT. Now, having such a latent variable potentially simplifies life quite a lot because now rather than looking explicitly at all the things that happened in the past, I only need to look at you know that past observation HT. This latent state summarizes all the relevant information, and so I can move forward. Now in a little bit more detail. What I have is I have some hidden state update, which maybe is just, you know, a multi-layer perceptron 
you know, that depends on the hidden state before and, you know, the observation. And then I have some output state, you know, which depends on the hidden state and, you know, that's it. So in doing that, I now keep all the past information around because I can just compress that further and further into that hidden state. But the obvious thing is that I can only compress that much into a finite dimensional representation. And we'll get to how to fix this later when we talk about transformers. Okay, so let's put this a little bit more into details into practice, namely language modeling. And it's a lot easier to understand what's going on in the language model, because we all can read really well, rather than a sequence of numbers for a time series, for instance. So let's say I take like the time machine by HG Wells, I could go and, you know, shred everything into five grams. So, for instance, if I had a Markovian assumption that would say, well, you know, the fifth character depends only on the previous four characters, then I would shred this into all five, you know, character snippets and model things appropriately. And so what I would do is I would really just write it as this, pro this product. And the problem is, unfortunately, that as I look at the long sequence, it gets computationally very expensive because even though we have, you know, a countably finite domain of words, we might still have a million words. And so if I look five words into the past, well, that's still, you know, 10 to the 30. So I cannot store this. The first thing to do is I need to actually decide, you know, what representation is good. And there are a number of possible choices because I need to deal with the fact that I might encounter new words and also that I might encounter, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to store counts for each and every unique word necessarily just because I have lots of them. So one way to do this is I just go and map each character into its own representation. So let's say the character t, t gets one, the character H gets one and so on. And the problem is this doesn't work terribly well because my language model that I would get out of this would first of all have, have to learn how to spell. And that feels wrong because, well, we know how to spell. Okay. The other extreme is I encode entire words. And so each word now has one ID and that gives me accurate spelling, but it doesn't work so well if somebody misspells it or if you have a really large vocabulary. So for instance, if you know what the word homoscedastic means, then you might have some idea of what the word heteroscedastic means just because, well, the scedastic part is noise related and the homo versus hetero is then whether it's the same or different noise. And so, you can figure out from that that heteroscedastic means it's different noise models. Uh, but the point is, if you just do a word encoding, no chance. So something that's in between is something called byte pair encoding, where you essentially encode frequent subsequences. Um, by the way, if you deal with Chinese, this is not so much of an issue because the Chinese characters actually kind of give you something that's pretty close to a BPE. But for English, it's a big deal. So now <clears throat> I go and, you know, generate my mini batch, right? And I can go and, you know, take all those possible subsequences and I go and pick a random offset and then I just pick, you know, a couple of random subsequences. The benefit is that now those samples are all essentially independent of each other. I mean, they're not in they're not technically independent, but they're independent issue enough that I can deal with that. The problem is that since I'm now throwing away all the context, any latent variable model is essentially screwed because it doesn't know what to do. I'm not carrying any information across, but it also means that the model has to work really hard. The alternative is I go and, you know, pick sequential subsequences and I keep my hidden state around 
between batches, but I just don't propagate the gradients. So as a result, I get dependent samples, but I get a model that's much more accurate relative to you know, what I actually want to model. Now, as a result, what I get therefore is I get sequence models where I want to have a causal direction in modeling. Maybe sometimes I want to use a Markovian assumption, but actually it's much better to use latent variables and we'll get to that later. And then in the end, well, we talked a little bit about how to actually build language models, how to get some snippets and how to train things in larger sequences. So there's a lot more that you would need to know about this. And I strongly recommend that you go and read the corresponding book chapters on RNNs and sequence models and text processing and language models in general.